Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Rhonda Alexander, with the BUILD Initiative. We would like to begin with a land acknowledgement from Giovanna Archuleta, Assistant Secretary for the New Mexico Early Childhood Education and Care Department. I would like to open up this meeting acknowledging our Mother Earth and the land she nurtures us with. The land where our children grow and the land that provides the food to feed them. When we talk about these resources, we must also acknowledge the lands of our tribal people and the deep spiritual and long-standing relationship of, our, of all tribal nations. Today I come from you from Nambea Winga, the land of my ancestors who cared for it and fought for it so that I may one day live and raise my own children on it. A relationship that predates colonial contact by thousands of years. Our ancestors still speak to us and guide us through our songs, ceremonies, and writings. Through removal, trail of tears, long walks, assimilation, and the idea that by removing children would kill a culture. Our ancestors did not give up. Our tribal people are some of the most resilient people in our country, continue, continuing to raise children to be resilient, who are nurtured through language and culture, the language and culture that cannot be removed. We must also acknowledge all other spirits who are forcefully displaced from their homelands and trafficked for labor and production on sacred native land. All of us collectively continue to experience the adversity that caused our ancestors and spirits who continue to hurt from actions done to them. Take a moment to pray these people find the healing and peace to raise their children in a world that has so many opportunities, but most importantly, create coexistence free of violence. Tribal people are praying people. This is where we are all tied. Our grandmothers and mothers continue to pray over us and as tribal people pray, they pray for people in the north, in the east, in the south, and the west. They pray for infants, children, adults, and elders, and our non-human relations, each with knowledge to share with us. As this conference begins, I hope that each of you are balanced in all directions and take a moment to appreciate what Mother Earth has given to us and how she continues to nurture us in many ways. I invite and encourage you to learn who are the original stewards of the land you live and work on and support those nations and children of those land. Thank you. The Bill team is excited to present this 20 webinars in 20 days for QRIS 2020 as we explore ideas, possibilities, and learn together about how we might recreate better more equitable systems with children, families, and early childhood professionals at the center of our efforts. We are grateful to the many individuals who took time to prepare sessions, generate content, and ideas to share. We believe the sessions will inspire you to build on these ideas, continue conversations, and innovate back in your own communities and states. We have learned a great deal as we prepared for, for the virtual events. One of our lessons is that a virtual event draws a much broader audience than an in-person conference. The BUILD QRIS conference was designed for early childhood systems leaders at the national, state, territory, tribal nation, and community levels. As registration rolled in for our event, we discovered many direct service providers from teachers to center directors and home-based providers signing up for these sessions. We welcome you to our learning community and look forward to hearing your perspective. We encourage you to share your comments, ideas, and questions in the chat box. As you know, we had to pivot from our in-person conference to a virtual conference, and we would like to say a sincere thank you to our sponsors who made that switch possible. Their support is essential to this event. And we've all become familiar with the Zoom platform over the past few months as we have used it to connect with friends, family, community, and colleagues. So we want to point out a few features that may be new to you. So first, when the PowerPoint isn't showing, you can choose your view. 
In the upper right hand corner, click on the speaker view to see the active speaker or click on the gallery view to see everyone. Next, we encourage you to provide feedback throughout the session by clicking participant to open the participant list and then clicking on the icons at the bottom to respond to questions or give us a thumbs up. Presenters may also use this feature to do some quick polling, so be ready. Chat with us. We encourage you to be active participants in this session, so please share your experiences and questions in the chat box. If there are polls in this session, a box will pop up on your screen and we encourage you to respond. This helps, helps us generate more conversation and enhances our learning together. So now I would like to turn it over to Shuri Fisher to introduce our presenters and launch our session. Take it away, Shuri. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, hi everyone, this is Sherry Fisher. I am um, with the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm with the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance and I'll let my other uh, colleagues introduce themselves. I am Tara Orlowski, the president for NARA, the National Association for Regulatory Administration. Welcome. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. My name is Dion Dobbins, and I am the senior director of research at Child Care Aware of America. Thank you. Next slide. We are here to talk to you today about the um, findings from our 2017 child care licensing study. Um, the study is one of a series of studies that started in 2005 as a collaboration between um, the uh, National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance and the National Association for Regulatory Administration, which is um, NARA. Um, and Tara and I work very closely together on, on, on the data collection and analysis of the, these studies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. The research began in 2005, and, and since then, we have done six uh, child care licensing studies, with the most recent one being from 2017. The purpose of the studies is to track uh, changes in licensing policies and practices and requirements for providers. Next, next slide. So uh, today I'm going to share with you some key findings from the 2017 uh, Child Care Licensing Study. And for each of the studies that we do, we do a comparative analysis that looks back to the previous studies. Uh, the findings and trends I will be sharing show the changes states have made since the 2014 licensing study. These key findings are ones where several states have made changes to their requirements or policies. So as you can see from the slide, um, the key findings were that many states added health and safety topics to training requirements. There are more states that require five types of background checks. And there's an, uh, I'll share a little bit uh, more about background checks uh, during the presentation. Uh, more states regulate group size for centers. Uh, nearly all states require staff and children to wash their hands at specific times. And states have added requirements about emergency preparedness and procedures. And more states are now inspecting at least once a year. So in the next slide. So now I'm going to go um, in depth a bit on uh, these findings. And I wanna say before I get started that is that if you have um, any questions, please put them in the chat box and um, I'll try to answer them as they come up. So first let's talk about health and safety training. Uh, after the reauthorization of the Child Care and Development Block Grant, we began tracking whether states have requirements for the same health and safety top training topics that are in the Child Care and Development Fund final rule. I'm sure you're all very familiar with uh, that rule and, um, and the health and safety 
requirements that are that are there for providers who are receiving funding from uh, the subsidy program from CCDF. Um, but we looked at the licensing requirements and this table shows the number of states that have requirements for each of the training topics, either for pre-service training or ongoing training. So as you can see, the highest uh, numbers of states have um, requirements for training in things like the recognition and reporting of child abuse and neglect, emergency preparedness and response planning, um, prevention and control of infectious disease. Some of the, the um, topics down near the bottom of the, of the table were things that were pretty unique to the CCDF um, training requirements, things like building in physical safety premises and handling and storage of hazardous materials. Um, there were a lot fewer states that had those specific topics in their training requirements. And those were states that tend to, to have uh, copied in the whole list of training, training topics into their licensing regulations. Um, on the next slide, please. We saw that a lot of states added um, requirements for, for the health and safety topics between 2014 and 2017, which was the same time period that states were impl implementing the CCDF requirements. For centers, the largest number of states added requirements for training in the topics most related to infant care, things like reducing sudden infant death syndrome. It went from a requirement of six, from 16 states in 2014 to 29 in 2017. The other one where a lot of states added, added the topic was preventing shaken baby syndrome, which went from 11 states in 2014 to 26 states in um, 2017. For family child care homes, there were a large number of states adding all of these topics. And um, there was not one or two topics that, there was probably about 10 or 11 states that added training topics um, across, across the board. It's interesting to note that there were, oh, not yet, <laughs> that there were 12 um, states that have requirements for all the topics for both centers and family child care. As I said earlier, those were states that copied in the exact topic list into their licensing regulations. Now that was not a federal requirement. The, the training topics are actually a requirement for providers uh, receiving CCDF. So those 12 states actually decided to go a step further than the federal, federal requirement and require the training for all child care providers that are um, either licensed or uh, that are license exempt who are um, receiving subsidy. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, the next, uh, this set of data includes information about background checks. And here we see that there are, there are increases in the number of states that require various types of background checks. This data here is for child care centers. Uh, you especially see the increases um, in the fingerprint requirements. Uh, the next slide. And then this chart shows um, what, we, what we tend to typically do is look across all of the different types of background checks and see how many states um, have requirements for all different all five of those types and the five were criminal history record checks fingerprint both um, state and federal um, the child abuse and neglect registry and the sex offender registry and there was a very large increase um, by about 50% um, across the board of this, the number of states that have, um, that are now requiring all five of those background checks. As you can see for centers, it went from 30% to 67%. So that was a, a very large, large increase, which we think is, is in probably an impact of the added requirements from the Child Care and Development Fund. 
Uh, next slide. Just to uh, give a little bit of background about the um, requirements by CCDF, the licensing study focused on uh, state licensing requirements, but with the reauthorization of the Child Care and Development Block Grant in 2014, came requirements about criminal background checks that states have to apply to all providers, not just those receiving the CCDF payment. And this is a this slide here shows the different types of background checks that are required by CCDF and some of the deadlines in which states needed to meet those requirements. Um, and as I said earlier, because we saw so many large increases in the background check requirements and licensing that we saw from 2014 to 2017, we think that those uh, probably were a result of these uh, federal requirements being put into place. Okay, next slide, please. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, child staff ratios. Um, this table shows an analysis of child staff ratios required in centers for various ages of the children. The columns here show the lowest ratio that we've, um, we see in, in licensing regulations, which for example, for infants is uh, three to one. The highest ratio that we've seen in, in uh, regulation, which for infants is six to one, and for those two columns, it shows the number of states that have either the lowest or the highest ratios. And then we look um, further to the right, and there shows the most common ratio for each of the age groups. And as you can see there, either uh, depending on the ages of the, of the infants, either 33 or 32 states um, have a ratio of four to one. And then at the end, the last column, shows uh, the Caring for Our Children guidelines. And that's uh, a set of national standards that we often use as uh, to look at what best practice would be in a child care program. So as you can see, you can see how many st states, uh, you can see here what the Caring for Our Children guidelines are. And you can tell from looking mostly at the lowest ratio required that there are only a few states that actually meet those guidelines. So there's only three states at this time that um, meet the guideline for um, infants. Um, for toddlers, there's only, um, there's no, uh, the, where their ratio was four to one, there's only um, three states that have either four to one or, or, or less. And so, the states, you can see where the most common ratio are and you can see how, how close states are um, to meeting those guidelines. But again, uh, caring for our children represents uh, the best practices. And um, often we see the, these lower ratios in um, QIS uh, uh, standards. So next slide. Now uh, for group size, uh, since 2014, there have been more states that regulate group sizes for child care centers. And this chart shows that there are um, fewer states that do not regulate group size, that um, there are more states that regulate group size for at least one age group, and there are no, there are fewer states that regulate group size for at least one age group and more uh, states that regulate group size for all the age groups. So uh, we saw that there was um, several states that had not regulated group size before and they added that requirement into their licensing regulations or if they had um, regulated group sizes for only some age groups they added a group size now for all the age groups. And again, because there was a requirement for uh, ratios of group size in the CCDF final rule, we think that perhaps these changes here were a result of uh, having that federal, federal rule that, that mentioned having a group size. Uh, next slide. So in family childcare homes, 
um, we're talking about uh, a home with um, one provider caring for a group of children. Um, and it is typically assumed that family child care homes where only one provider caring for children could have a small group size. But our data shows that when additional school age children can be part of a group for a part of the day, those groups can be large. Um, there are currently 13 states that allow six preschool age children in a family child care home, plus some additional school age children, and 10 states that allow um, a minute, uh, allow more, 10 or more school age children, and uh, 35 states allow fewer than 10 with uh, no school age children. So, um, near, but in addition, nearly all of the states set a limit on the maximum number of infants and toddlers that can be in care. And they count the provider's children or other children living in the home as, as the maximum. So the, uh, there's uh, very little change that we've seen um, in terms of group sizes in family child care. Uh, but I did want to share share this data because um, I know that group size is one of the things that people are looking at in the current pandemic situation and, and about keeping group sizes fairly small or close to uh, what the licensing requirement is. Okay, next slide. So another area where um, states, several states added requirements was in emergency preparedness. And this table shows that nearly all states have um, requirements for either emergency procedures or drills, or doing conducting some kind of a fire or an emergency drill. Um, if we look down the table, um, you'll see that uh, very large numbers of, of states have requirements for emergency preparedness procedures. And those are things like being prepared for a nat natural disaster or a power outage, or even an act of violence that could happen at the center, um, such as a, an active shooter or, or something like that. Um, and then there was, there's about, uh, about half of the states have um, emergency or evacuation plans, written plans in place, are required to have those in place. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the, um, the data about smoke detectors and fire extinguishers as part of the fire safety requirements. And as you can see, they, the percentages are fairly low for um, childcare centers. I suspect that the number of states that require um, those in centers is so low because centers are required to have an inspection by the fire marshal. As you'll see there, 100% of states uh, need to have those inspections. And the state's fire codes probably include this. So the licensing regulations do not. But the percentages of states that include those requirements in um, uh, licensing for family child care homes and group child care homes is, is much larger for uh, having that requirement for uh, smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. So the next slide shows, um, just uh, as I said, this was, this was an area where we saw several states have um, make changes in their requirements. There were, for centers, there were seven states that um, added new requirements about emergency preparedness procedures and five states that added uh, emergency and evacuation plans. And one interesting thing was that the, um, the number of states that required fire extinguishers and smoke detectors was even lower in 2014, and that there were six states and three states uh, respectively that added those requirements um, when we uh, looked at the data in 2017. And now on the next slide, this shows that um, in addition, for family child care homes and group child care homes, 
there were several states that um, added requirements about having um, an emergency or evacuation plan um, and implementing emergency preparedness procedures. Five states had that, uh, ch had that change and also conducting fire and emergency drills. There were four states that added that to their requirements. So I'm now going to uh, turn this over to my colleague, Tara, who's going to share um, some more findings from the study. Thank you, Sherry. So one of the things that we also have done in addition to the study, and as Sherry said, uh, NARA and the National Center have been working on this study for many years, and Sherry and I look at this data all the time because um, we are big data nerds. Um, so we enjoy looking at this and seeing what the trends are. But we've also started looking at it in responses to COVID-19 um, and then doing some additional um, informal polls with states and asking questions. So one of the things that we have found, as Sherry mentioned, is a reduction of group size. So we have many states who are using um, the, the 10 um, guidance um, from the CDC as their group size, um, with some exceptions, um, including staff or not including staff. Some of the states vary on that. But all of them are looking at that. And then part of what they're doing is having programs add um, walls or temporary walls to rooms so that they can split the room into two um, settings so that they don't go over that group size. Additionally, we have found that many of the licensing programs are working with other agencies to help providers ensure that supplies and food are available in their area and helping connect with resources. So there's a lot of technical assistance going on around cleaning supplies and food availability. Additionally, we also see some waivers of some of the rules and regulations. So um, some of the more frequent ones that we see is waivers around timeline for training. There are several states who have extended it or have allowed people to use online training in lieu of face-to-face -face training. We've also seen some states allowing online CPR or portions of the CPR to be done online in order to meet the compliance, um, whereas previously they had not done that. There's um, an emphasis on hand washing and other sanitation going on, so there's a lot of technical support being provided out there from licensing on ensuring sanitation of the environment, proper hand washing, really enforcing that hand washing. And then we're also seeing um, just technical assistance in lots of areas. How do you socially distance young individuals? How do you um, work with children to understand the hand washing, et cetera? And so there's a lot of technical assistance being provided in those areas. So the other thing that we're seeing is, is around health and safety standards. Um, a lot of programs are implementing daily temperature and illness screenings as children come into the program. We have a lot of um, states that have shared that their provi providers are doing um, sort of drive-by drop-offs so that the parents don't have to come into the center. Some of them are getting them right from the car while others of them are stopping them at the lobby and then taking the child back to reduce the number of adults that are in the environment. So we're seeing that. Again, a lot of emphasis on sanitation and hygiene. Um, some states are putting out um, guidance papers or posters to help providers with the sanitation and hygiene. A lot of them are using the Caring for Our Children guidance on what needs to be um, sanitized, disinfected, and how often that happens. And then with social distancing, we continue to explore what that looks like um, in care, particularly with young ones. And also, what does that look like with licensing counselors in terms of going in for inspections? We're going to talk about that in just one second. We're also seeing changes at mealtime, so not doing family style meals right now, um, as well as um, positioning the children and adults a little bit um, further apart during mealtime so as to have more um, socially distanced space with them. 
So with inspections, as Sherry said, um, this is one of the things that we look at is how frequent do our licensing counselors go out for inspections. So in the 2017 study, um, we saw that um, when we look at centers, homes, and group homes, that um, 21 states were doing inspections more than once a year in centers. We have 27 that were doing them once a year and three that were doing them less than once a year. And for family homes, um, 17 more than once a year, 24 once a year, and three more than once a year with group homes with very similar numbers. So we also looked at this around COVID and asked our licensing teams of how did COVID impact inspections? And so what we found is that many states were still conducting um, on-site inspections, but then we also had a new phenomenon of virtual inspections popping up. So one of the things um, that NARA did was we did put out a guidance document on virtual inspections, and we're gonna talk about resources in a minute where you can find that. Um, but what that meant for states varied. So for some states, they did virtual inspections by having providers send in information prior to the inspection, paperwork, sorts of things. And then during the inspection, would use things like FaceTime or Zoom or Teams or other video conferencing tools to then have the provider walk around their program. And they did this both for centers and family homes. We had some states that stopped inspections temporarily, except in cases of complaints um, or reinspections for non-compliance. Um, and so as you can see from the chart on screen, it did vary repeatedly. We're starting to see states um, start to figure out how they're going to go back and do on-site inspections. So some states are looking at county data on COVID incidents and going to counties more frequently that have less incidents and still staying virtual with those that have higher incidents. We have other states that are looking at plans to go back out statewide. Um, and so they're all putting together their guidance now. And in some states as the second wave is starting to hit, we're starting to see them pull back a little bit more. So um, COVID is one of those ever-changing things. And I feel like every day when we're talking to people, it's changing just a little bit. Um, and we're just pivoting as we need to to get through this pandemic. The other thing um, that we do know also is that some states did ask for some temporary waivers. Um, and so, you know, we do that in times of disaster, financial crisis. And so as a result of COVID-19, 28 states and territories and one tribe requested and were approved waivers um, for pre-licensure and annual health and safety inspections. Um, and there's additional information on the Office of Child Care website for that information. So we have a number of resources that are available. So one thing that we do with each of the licensing studies is put out a trends paper. So this looks at what trends are we seeing. So there's a trends paper for childcare, one for family home and one for group home. And so those are available online. And then additionally, there is the National Database of Childcare Licensing Regulations that is also available. So by clicking a state, you can get to the regulations for that state. And then the other, resource that's available is on the NARA website. You can actually get the entire child care licensing study, um, as well as we also link to the trends papers from there. NARA is also hosting a COVID resource page um, where you can get access to different resources from different states um, that have posted things there, as well as some of the national papers and blogs that are being posted. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dion, who is going to talk about the benchmarking project. Thank you, Tara. Um, I really appreciate the work that you and Sherry do around really helping us understand the landscape of um, child care licensing and regulations. And I think it's a great segue into the work that we at Child Care Aware do around 
helping people understand kind of the um, quality and the assessment of licensing and how folks are doing across the country um, with regulations um, and different benchmarks. So I'm really pleased today to um, be able to talk with you about our child care benchmarking licensing project. Um, if you've heard me talk about this before, it's been a project that's been a little over two years in the making. Um, and um, we were hoping that with this presentation, um, if it was going to be live and we wouldn't have had COVID-19, our um, initial findings and our first pi five pilot states would have been released and we would have, um, be able to share with you the actual tool itself. That has been postponed, but I can share with you kind of where we are um, with this pr presentation. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of Child Care Aware of America. We are a um, nonprofit and we're based in Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, but we're a national organization. We are a membership organization um, and our vision and our um, our vision is around ensuring that all children have access to quality, affordable childcare. And so for over 10 years, um, we have had experience in, in assessing childcare licensing and kind of understanding, helping states understand where they, where their licensing standards um, sit with respect or com in comparison to others. So um, we release reports each year for either center-based family child care or family-based child care through 2013. And these reports ranked states and highlighted their alignment, either poor or, or, or good, with state regulations on evidence-based evidence practices. And when I say that, we really looked at all of the um, existing kind of research and existing um, resources out there for caring for our so for example, caring for our children, which um, Sherry and Tara talked about, um, HHS reports on quality licensing, NACI, um, and we just really wanted to have a sense of like um, the quality and what, what's, what the literature says around um, opportunities for quality improvement for our licensing standards. Um, we documented in those reports every other year, they were called, We Can Do Better, and leaving children to chance. Um, and our last one was we can do better in 2013. We documented states oversight of child care licensing um, and their program bench standards. Um, and typically, um, if you're familiar with those, you would kind of get you would get a sense of um, we had scorecards for every state and state rankings on each of those um, oversight bench on, on each of those benchmark standards. Um, that was a a great project um, in 2013. That was our last one. And in 2014, as, as you know, is when we had reauthorization. Um, so we were very excited when in 2014 um, to see that some of the areas that we um, had a laser focus on, including background checks and ratios and, and the health um, trainings made it into the final reauthorization and the final rule. So um, many states used our ranking reports to help them push the needle or move the needle around um, pushing their states to um, have more quality childcare licensing standards or regulations. And um, we'd like to, we like to think that some of our work um, helped to push um, the national um, picture on childcare licensing as well. In 2017, we, um, took a step back knowing that we needed to rethink our work um, with We Can Do Better and Leaving Children a Chance. Um, and we collaborated with researchers at the University of Miami where we developed what we called the Child Care Licensing Database, um, where we collected data from child care licensing um, manuals, um, some of the um, manuals that, that Tara mentioned when she said you could go to the website um, at NARA and check out where each of the state's manuals are. Um, we compared each state's licensing standards to, for um, child care centers and family child care providers and compared to them to caring for our children basics. 
Um, we laid out, we, so if you know anything about caring for our children basics, there are about eight, there are eight main topics and each topic has multiple standards, which collectively lay out minimum health and safety protections for childcare settings. Um, so if you had a chance to go through this, um, it's, it's all online, you would go through the database and you'd see that you could select the state, figure out, look at the standard and the topic, um, drill down by each substandard to see if their state licensing guidelines are in alignment with DFOC basics. Um, and when they weren't, there was a justification for users. Um, they all, we also linked them to their, the current state manual, um, state licensing manuals. And there was a print friendly sheet where you could get a sense of how um, you could see their, whether or not they met those, um, whether or not they aligned with caring for our children basics. Um, the thing about it was it was very strict the way we scored it. It was either yes, you are aligned or no, you aren't. Um, so the, um, we, we worked with, as I mentioned, University of Miami and we had um, research assistants do that work for us. And um, each of the research assistants who did that, score, did that scoring, they had to reach um, our iterator reliability of 80%. So after that launch of the 2017 Child Care Licensing Database, we um, heard from key stakeholders and they were, while they were excited that we had a new perspective on looking at the state of child care licensing, many of them noted that since the standards were rated either as meets or doesn't meet, they couldn't get partial credit. And it was not as helpful for folks who were trying to move the needle like our other reports were and that they needed, they wanted to be able to benchmark their progress um, on where they were and where they needed to go towards some level of quality. Um, and they wanted to have that benchmark to help them think about how they could move forward. So um, they wanted, the, the kinds of things they asked for was a scoring rubric that helped to describe how they were doing against um, CCDBG standards or requirements. Um, how far along a on, on a continuum they um, needed to meet um, a, a standard. Um, and they also wanted guidance on how they should make and prioritize changes to the licensing manual. So therefore we um, built or we um, launched our child care licensing benchmark project and tool. So if we can go to the next slide. So the goals of our project was to engage stakeholders from all levels throughout the project. And we wanted them to help us think about how we could update the licensing benchmarks that we had created back in the day with We Can Do Better and Leaving Children to Chance, um, considering the new policy implications and best practice advancements. We wanted to develop a rubric um, that was um, a little bit more descriptive and also more, um, let's see, strength-based um, that guided the scoring and ranking for the tool. And we wanted to design a tool that provided states with a point in time status um, that we could then update every year and also help them think about opportunities um, to consider for future advancements in their state line licensing standards. So there was a, like an advocate, adv advocacy piece of this work as well. Next slide. So again, as I mentioned, we didn't wanna do this in a vacuum. We wanted to have buy-in from the field and get the perspective of those who were dealing with licensing as part of their work, either as a monitor or a national leader or a researcher or even as a consumer. So we had several different ways that people could be part of the stakeholder engagement. Um, we had um, our larger, what we called our, our child care licensing benchmark work group. We had what we called a review panel, which I'll explain a little bit later, but it was fewer people. And then we had a state, state pilot where we piloted the actual tool after it was built. You can go to the next slide. So um, the first one, of course, was our benchmarking, uh, sorry, benchmarking work, work group. Um, and then, which was larger, there were 27 individuals representing 20 organizations and entities. They met seven times a year um, between actually December of 2017 and September 2018. We had 90 minute um, 
conference calls and webinars. We had homework for them after every session and one face-to-face -face meeting in April of 2018. Um, work group members were expected or they participated in lots of activities between scheduled group meetings. Um, as I mentioned, there was homework. Um, we really appreciated these folks because they utilize, we were able to utilize their expertise um, from the individual members and get their feedback and input throughout. Um, the um, types of people that were part of our benchmarking work group are the, those that are listed below. We had administrators um, and, and invited folks from both state and federal offices. We had um, definitely state licensing personnel and folks like Tara at the national level helping us with this work. We had CCRNR leaders. Other national organizations, including NARA, but other national organizations um, who do research and advocacy. We also included families, um, and then early childhood and licensing experts were part of our group. We also had a smaller team review, which was we called the review panel. These were folks who were unable to commit to the sort of rigorous schedule that we had set up for the um, work group, but expressed interest in reviewing the um, the work of the work group and providing feedback as we were developing the final tool. So over the 10 month period, we did a number of things with the larger work group. Um, we had, um, we created some matrices where we did some crosswalks of the different reports that we did um, with the, the CCDBG um, grant act. We also um, did a crosswalk of the matrix um, for C CFOC basics with our reports, trying to get to see like where we were, um, where we had been and whether or not there were places that were needing to shore up or to add to our tool. We had a rich discussion about the benchmarks and, a, and the direction for the tool and um, lots of, like I said, we had the face-to-face -face meeting in which we broke out into groups and talked about the different specific benchmarks based on the where people sat in their organization and their subject matter expertise. Um, we identified new categories and revised descriptions. Um, we had um, some smaller breakout groups um, on specific issues. And um, just really, like I said, it was a good year and a half process that we went through. Um, after that, the review panel you know, took a look at it and provided feedback. And then eventually we had a benchmarking pilot, which I will share a little bit about in a, in a few minutes. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the work group, their whole goal was to help us develop the relevant and useful benchmarking, um, licensing benchmarks for states. And as I mentioned, we reviewed a number of sources and did them crosswalks and these are the ones that these are some of the ones that we did but we made sure to um, include you know things like our formal reports but also um, standards that are already out there um, like NACI and NASDC um, also data that has been collected and and trends like um, Tara and Sherry has sh shared with us um, and the primary accomplishment of our team was or, or the, of this work group was the development of 14 benchmarks. So there were seven for um, the program one and seven for oversight benchmarks. And they, um, with the program ones, we had um, benchmarks that were folk, that were either center-based or family child care. And then the oversight ones were really about the monitoring piece of it and they were relevant for both center-based and um, family child care. Go to the next slide, please. The seven, I mean, the 14 benchmarks are listed here. Um, if you are familiar with We Can Do Better and Leaving Children a Chance, you'll see that there are some very similar ones. Um, after going back and forth with the work group, um, we were thinking that it would be a totally different type of tool, but recognized also with um, by looking at what the research said, understanding what the most current um, uh, research and knowledge was saying about program standards um, and um, licensing and also just hearing back from folks about what was really important when they took this work to um, think about advocacy and pushing the needle um, and then finally understanding what the um, 
the act said, we ended up having most of the same ones and some actual new ones. Um, of course, we've got more around the, um, the health and safety policies and the professional development, um, making sure that we had included the information about the health rules um, and the background check, in, check information um, was, is more in line with what now the, um, the final rule says. So very similar to kind of what Sherry was talking about, how um, knowing, keeping in mind what the, what the law says and um, how things have, you know, keeping, making sure that we reflected that in our work. So if you can go to the next slide. So we also, in addition to coming up with the 14 different benchmark seven um, program and seven oversight, um, one of the things that came out of the work group and out of the review group was to really consider the fact that um, as we were revising the benchmarks, some of them were more about um, making sure that we were thinking about and aligning with um, the final rule and others were really moving toward quality. And so level one are more reflective of the types of things that you would see in um, the law. And level two were more towards moving toward quality. So those m would be considered um, more of the sort of best practices kinds of things and um, moving toward quality. So that was something that came out of the work group too that it would be important to kind of understand um, how states are doing in general, but then also how they're doing um, toward mo moving toward quality. So this is an, is an example for one of the benchmarks. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, we did do the work group process and then the review process. And the third part was input from states. We um, were able to recruit um, five states, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Oklahoma, and Tennessee, to work with us. Um, it was a very purposive sample. It was not, of course, representative. These pilot states um, were um, very interested in the work that we were doing. A couple of them had representatives on our work group or our review group. And also one of the things that we had to consider is um, the way we're doing this work um, ensures that we um, include their input for the licensing benchmarking tool. Um, and so it, it can be a little bit labor intensive for the states to be involved. And so we needed states that were committed to putting in that um, work and to um, having the bandwidth, frankly, to work with us to do this pilot. So as I mentioned that we had those five states. So the first part was to recruit those states. Um, we wanted a minimum of one representative from each state um, that to participate in what we had, what we called an introductory webinar around the project. Um, and then each state um, created, a, I mean, completed a survey each um, to identify some team members that would be part of uh, the group that went through the process. Um, we wanted them to have folks who were from different perspectives. We definitely wanted some people who were, who understood licensing, but also um, con asked them to consider including po folks from childcare programs, families, um, and folks from like, um, from state organizations um, and CCRNRs. So we were kind of like, thinking through like how we did it with our um, work group and wanted to kind of model that and suggested that they include those kinds of people in their, in their team. What we did is we had them um, identify their states and their team, their team contact. And throughout that process, we um, provided train, we provided technical assistance and, and completing the tool with them. And, um, assisted with, assisted on answering questions. So then we sent out the link to the program benchmarks, the first seven, and gave them um, the team um, three to four weeks to um, go through it and complete it. Then we had a check-in call with them halfway through that point 
um, and just to get a sense of, you know, how is this going or, or do, is this, is there any way we could make this process a little bit um, more fluid or easily easier to understand? Um, then we, um, when they finish the program benchmark, ask them to um, send that back to us, and then we sent them the oversight benchmark survey. And again, the team completed the survey within three to four weeks. And um, again, halfway through that process, we had a call in to check how things were going and if they needed any support. Um, once we got both the um, benchmarks, um, the uh, program benchmarks and the oversight benchmarks back, we reviewed their re responses. And we one of the things that we've asked them to do in this prop, in this piece, you know, when they're doing their work, is to not just say yes or no, we're doing this, but to provide evidence. And it could be evidence in their licensing regulations or in um, rules or guidance or law that, um, you know, will help them make the case that they've addressed this issue. Um, and we re we um, had a team that reviewed each re each pilot state's responses and validated their information based on the documentation they provided. Um, then we sent them back a set of detailed questions when we weren't sure whether or not we agreed with them or if we weren't it wasn't clear whether their documentation was um, truly representative of the work that we were asking them about. So there was a great deal of validation and back and forth with them. And then um, finally, so we got their feedback and ended up coming up to conclusions or to consensus on the scores. Um, after that was all over, we conducted a, a focus group with them, a virtual focus group to gather their feedback and recommendations. Here, whether or not there are places that they thought we could um, shore up the tool, make it easier to use, make it easier to understand um, any instructions that we needed to provide. And then finally, um, we created a profile um, for each of the states based on their scores for their standards. Um, and we looked at um, for all of the benchmarks as well as for level one and level two for family child care and for center-based care. Um, we shared the rubric and with them um, that we created with, um, we uh, had our work group come back and help us think through the work the rubric. Um, and we shared that with each state and got their feedback again um, and comments on the scoring and rubric. And then finally, we made um, revisions to the survey and the scoring process based on the feedback from the focus groups and the pilot team and our um, work group. So we can go to the next slide. Um, I think it, I think going through this um, stakeholder involvement process was a really helpful thing. Um, it was very labor intensive. We're hoping to maybe automate a little bit of that um, in the next, when we do the next um, states, um, we've learned a lot of lessons. But I believe that by collaborating with states, we're improving the way that we're um, scoring and assessing their licensing um, standards and that we're hoping that um, the end product will be that you'll have an improved utility and accuracy um, for that work. And then um, I do believe that the first time they do this, it's going to be more labor intensive. And then the next, when we go to review and revise, it will be more about like, this is what you said last time. Do you agree? Is there a place, are there places that we can um, change? And if you can provide the evidence, we'll change. So I think the heavy part, the heavy lift is in the first year. Um, but we had them, we had stakeholders involved through the whole process, as I mentioned, through the development piece where we actually, you know, helped, we create, they, we use them to help create the benchmarks and update them and um, make sure that they were based on, um, the existing tools out there, and then through the review process. So the state's self-review that they did, the technical assistance that we provided, having them go back and forth with us on the verification, and then the final, the final um, scores that came out. Um, it was also great because it gave us an opportunity for them to come back to us to share their feedback on why, if they didn't do well on a benchmark or if they, um, had problems, they could really share with us the implementation barriers that they may have, 
um, or the reasons why things weren't, um, you know, where, why they didn't maybe score as well. But also it was a great place because we'll hope, we are hoping that, you know, once we get um, all 50 states, we can also share, you know, facilitators to doing, you know, having a great score, um, you know, where they're, um, any key champions, where there are opportunities for them to um, move the needle, kind of understanding those facilitators as well. Um, I think it was also great because, as I mentioned, our earlier reports were, you know, there was one year we did centers and next year we did family child care. But with this, um, it's a great opportunity for us to gather that information on family child care and centers in one space. Um, Going forward, um, we have been working with Tara um, to um, get some information from the National Licensing Study where she identified that, you know, hey, you guys are answer asking some of the same questions that we, coll that we collected um, for our survey. So are there places where we could pre-fill this tool using the data that they've already collected to, and, and then the question would be, do you agree with this or not? And if there are changes um, or if you've updated it, you know, feel free to let us know. But like, it could make it a little bit easier, um, a little bit of less burden on states. Um, and we were hoping to start doing that um, after we released the, um, the first five pilot states, but because of COVID-19, we haven't started data collection again. Um, the other final thing I think is, that's really great is that we're um, actually, while we're there, collecting some data elements similar to what Tara's team and, and Sherry's team has been doing around the landscape um, since we'll be, you know, updating that information every year or so. Um, so I, I'm really excited about that as well. Can I go to the next slide, please? Um, just, um, I don't want to get into the details too much, but just in general, we have, um, when states receive their scores, there are a total of a 290 benchmarking data points. So as I mentioned, it's pretty, it's pretty extensive and can be kind of labor intensive. There are 213 program data points um, for, um, like I said, programs, 112 or for related to the center-based ones and 92 are related to family child care. And then if you're breaking it down by like the level one versus level two, um, there are 117 that are level one and then 87 that are level two. Um, for oversight, again, um, there are 77 possible data points with 39 that are at level two and 36 that are at level, I mean, 39 that are at level one, 36 that are at level two. And so the way that it scored is, because we wanted, we didn't want just to share with them, oh, this is what the benchmark says. We took the benchmark and then created questions for each of the big pieces of the, the benchmark. So um, there, there might be five or six questions for each benchmark. Um, each benchmark, each question is worth a point if it's yes. And so the score is based on the percentages of yes, yeses per benchmark score. So if you go to the next slide. So the percentages that I was sharing with you, um, you'll see we created a, a rubric. We had many different um, acronyms. Um, this is the one that won out. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is kind of be strength-based. So um, even if you were in the lower, like zero to 33%, um, you're still coming along, you're still trying. Um, so we came up with CARE, which is coming along, advancing, really close, and an exciting accomplishment. All of those, like if you look at the arrow from C to E, um, E would be striving toward quality. We never say that, um, some uh, state or any of the standards are at quality because even E, there's always room for improvement. So that's why we said it was an exciting accomplishment instead of like you have 100% and you're great and you don't need to do anything new. Um, so the next slide, please. So this is a sample um, state snapshot. Um, we tried to keep in mind the 
um, ways that folks used our um, reports in the past where they did like to have it as, you know, a front and back one pager that kind of gave you an overview of how a state was doing on each thing. So um, each of the, um, what you get is um, an overall score for the state based on all of the data points where you can kind of see where, you know, whether you're a C, A, a an R, or an E. Um, you get um, the standard levels for one and two. Again, you can get a sense of where your state is for each of those standard levels as a total. Um, and then you get a separate score for either the oversight standards and the program standards. And for the oversight ones, you um, would only um, be looking at, there's only one score um, for each of those seven. For the program standards, you get a score for family child care or center-based. Um, it's kind of hard to see on this, but you know, they're basically circles that would, um, that share that, you know, if you think about like your progress towards something and toward 100%, you would see that those circles are uh, representative of that. And the colors are kind of aligned with um, with the circles as well. So if you have a purple circle, you know that you're in the R range. If you have a green circle, you know that you're in the green range. I mean, you're in the E range. Um, the other thing that we did include was, because we know that these may be used by, um, folks who just kind of be like, okay, well, what does this all mean? There's a lot of scores here. There's some takeaways that we put on the bottom there that would be tailored for each state. So this is a, uh, a sample. So each state that we would work with would get one of these scores. Um, and eventually we would hope to have all 50. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so here's where we are. Um, our original, our original um, plan was to roll all this out literally March like second or something like that. So we we got slammed by COVID nineteen. Um, but our approach is revised. Um, we have a process paper that kind of takes you through what I was talking about with the stakeholder in, involvement and what we did, and our first five pilot state rankings, which is ready to go. Um, and we're hoping to release that um, maybe this fall or early winter. Um, and um, we are also at this time, um, if you look at the bottom there, we're developing some advocacy tools and maybe considering um, a tool around um, the COVID-19 impact. So when all those are done, we're, we're hoping that we can both do the paper, the advocacy tools and the pilot and the five pilot state rankings and kind of push that out. Um, we're hoping to do that because we also think that that will help us recruit new, new cohorts. So we want to do up to 10 state teams at a time. Um, again, providing the technical assistance um, with all of them until everything's been completed. Um, and our aim is to do that through mid-2021, um, although it may take longer just depending upon, you know, state's bandwidth to work with us. Um, I think the big thing is for us will be, as I mentioned, the beginning, the, the, the first time they do this will be the heaviest lift, but then going forward, it will be a matter of us just getting updates from them. Um, what people really miss about leaving children a chance and we can do better are those rankings and comparisons. Um, and what we ultimately want to do is have all, all 50 states. We want it to be an interactive online tool. Um, where we'll have filters and you can kind of look uh, at your state versus other states. Um, and our goal is to work with states to do this, but if that doesn't work, we'll do the assessment ourselves um, for any team that um, does not want to work with us. But we really do want to kind of keep that um, stakeholder input process in place. Next slide, please. Um, so I do believe we were going to ask um, some polls here first before, yeah. So um, one of the things we wanted to ask um, our viewers today is um, whether or not you think that 
states should have separate set a separate set of licensing requirements or at least have um, uh, some documents ready to go in the case of a crisis or emergency situation. You know, we're kind of in the midst of this now and we were kind of building the ship as, as COVID-19 happened. But like if we were to think about the future and really think about um, what we would want to do differently or have in place, is that something that you think would be useful? And it, um, I'll give some folks some time to answer. So far, it looks like people are saying yes. Great, I really appreciate your comments. Um, I think for the most part, we're seeing yes. I know about half of the folks have voted. Um, give you a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds, and then I'll close it out. So yeah, it looks like most people are agreeing that maybe we could be a little bit more proactive, have some of those sort of um, Inf that sort of licensing information um, created and thought of before something happens um, and have it ready to go. Okay, thank you. Um, here's the second slide. I mean, I'm sorry, the second uh, question, maybe. Yes. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we're trying to do is create um, a, um, an advocacy tool for folks or a, a tool that even if we don't call it advocacy will help states think through you know where they need to go as they're benchmarking um, and would it be helpful um, for us to have clear examples of what we've been considering as benchmark quality to share with stakeholders as you're using a tool like this um, i think one of the things that um, we have been thinking about is, okay, so I didn't score well on this piece. What does that mean? And do you have any examples for me about um, that you can share with me around states that have, have tried to do this work and do it well? Looks like most people are saying that they think we should think about that. So just so you know, um, a little bit about what we're thinking for our advocacy tool. Um, and for our, um, sort of helping states think through what they might be able to use the, the um, tool for, it looks like most people, almost everybody is saying would be helpful to have uh, clear examples. Um, we're going to, as I mentioned, have every state um, get a one page report, you know, with the front back information like I shared. But in addition, we're hoping to provide states with a tool that will give them more detailed information about A, why the benchmark is important and why that kind of regulation or licensing standard is important um, for, health, for the health and safety of children. Um, empowering, then having a section in there what that would empower them to create a roadmap or create next steps for improving their regulations. And um, really help them understand another part where it would help them understand where their current standing is with each benchmark. And eventually, um, as we work across 50 states, being able to share where they, where they sit in, um, in relation to other states. And then finally have some reflective questions for them to help them decide how they can advocate or learn more about what's out there with regard to improving their licensing system. Um, and we want to kind of prevent, present that in a frame of um, very strength-based um, um, tool for them. So um, I wanted to also, in addition to including, you know, the polling that we have, um, thinking through, I have some questions here on this slide that one, one slide is really about COVID-19 and the other is really about um, our advocacy tool. But um, feel free to um, chat, um, include any comments in the chat. Um, I'll see if I can answer some of those. But um, the first um, question that I have is um, how, this is really about COVID-19, how has your state overcome barriers to providing um, healthy and safety care, um, safety, a healthy and safe environment for children in care? Um, keeping in mind that COVID-19 may have made that a little bit difficult. Feel free to 
put something in the, in the um, chat box. I have here keeping updated information on a daily basis with regards to the, tw um, the, the state cases of COVID-19, that's helpful. Um, I have someone um, has mentioned they have statewide informational calls with the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education so that everybody's kind of um, keeping track of everything and everybody's communicating, it seems like. Okay. Feel free to keep writing. Um, I will continue to ask some questions. Um, let's see. If you, um, in light of COVID-19, are there any requirement changes that you think should be considered in the future? And also maybe the next question, this kind of goes along with it. What do you think, what do you feel the most um, important or critical licensing requirements are, um, should be included during times of a crisis? Oh, this one's great. Someone mentioned that they were providing a one-stop place for current updates and, and information. Any thoughts on like um, anything that you would change if you had a magic wand and you, or you had a crystal ball and knew that, that this was going to happen or anything that you think are critical to include during times of crisis or emergency? We have one here where someone mentioned that they really um, emphasizing the hand washing and sanitizing. That makes sense, totally makes sense. Okay, well, we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, and here's some of the questions. Um, as I mentioned, we are really interested in making sure that you know, folks not ju don't just get the results, but they understand how they could possibly be used. And so my question to you is, um, if you were uh, an advocate or someone at the state level who were trying to um, push for, to move the needle around regulations and licensing, what kinds of tools will be helpful for you um, to either increase the quality of your standards or to share your results with um, stakeholders in your community, in your state. Someone also mentioned, going back to the previous slide, um, that they um, it, it's helpful that they've had the sort of streamlined information on protocols if there are positive COVID um, cases at programs. So really having those um, protocols available um, so that they're easy to use and that folks know where they are sounds like a a good um, way of considering this as, as well. So thinking about like pushing the needle or um, any tools that you would need, what in a perfect world, what would you need to help you um, push for change in your state? To sort of the, the things that I outlined about our, our ideas around creating um, the tool, uh, uh, an advocacy tool, um, makes sense to folks. Childcare staff are essential workers. Okay. So I'm assuming that's more about the uh, questions that I had earlier around um, making the case during times of. Um, crisis, the things that we want to make sure we consider. Great. Um, I don't want to take away from um, Sherry or Tara, or Tara, Tara, if there's any questions that you want to ask um, the audience, I'm happy to sh let you have this time. I don't have additional questions, Dion. I think you ask really good questions. I know Nara um, has been working with you and other staff there to help kind of move these conversations forward. So this input that people gave was great. Any additional input, we would definitely welcome. 
um, we see this as a time to really look at licensing um, and um, what does that look like as we move forward. So I think we're in exciting times, even though we're in very unpredictable times. Yeah. Absolutely. Sherry, did you have anything to add? No, I would, um, you know, ditto what, what Tara said. Great. Well, um, I can turn it back over to the, um, the, uh, the leaders of this webinar. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, for our participants, before you all sign off, we encourage you to just give us some feedback um, on today's webinar. So some poll questions are popping up on your screen and let us know, also let us know in the chat box what was useful, significant, uh, or new, and how we can improve the webinar. Um, I would also like to thank our session leaders again today for this interesting and informative opportunity. We, we appreciate the contributions from participants in the chat box. So thank you all. Have a great day.